So I'm standing here in a patch of pristine uh, or semi-pristine uh, thicket fenbos mosaic. I want to kind of give you a sense of the species richness that you'll find um, in a patch like this so you can kind of get an idea of what to where that like 10 by 10 uh, species data came from you know if you look in those excel spreadsheets you see a, a list of species uh, down down the first column and then uh, at each each site you've got the percentage cover of those species so this is what uh, kind of a pristine non-invaded site looks like although it is starting to get invaded uh, so this is this is the culprit here, or one of the culprits. This is a acacia cyclops. You can see it's it kind of looks a little bit like a guest uh, in in the in the beginning stages of it. I'll show you a bit later what it looks like when it gets going and what kind of horrific uh, damage it does to our our native flora. So let's just have a quick look here. Let's ah uh, this beautiful plant here, uh, Salvia africana lutea, uh, beautiful beautiful silver silver leaves um, what's interesting is that this is a, a an underground tree what you'll find is that this has got root suckers that go to that individual over there so you actually think like oh this is one plant here uh, and there's another uh, and that's a different plant different individual but actually they're the same they're connected underground so there's one uh, we've got osteospermum monoliferum we've got your uh, Patelichia pyracantha, uh, we've got Cassonia uh, thesiflora right here. Geez, I'm not even having to move anywhere. Uh, we've got Roycissus tridentata uh, over here. We've got uh, Circea crenata. Okay, let's have a look. What else have we missing? Oh, we got an asparagus. Oh, I can never remember all the, all the uh, asparagus species. Uh, and they, they keep on changing the names as well. So there's one there. So I mean, literally, I I haven't taken a step yet, and I've just been rattling off species. Uh, uh, this is a, a Helichrysum. Uh, it's either Cymosum or Tomentosa. I uh, I'll get the right name for you there. Yeah. So I mean, that's just the that's just in this in this in this little spot. So super super rich and uh quite difficult to survey i mean it's just imagine like trying trying to get my boots and yeah and it's like it's it's quite a it's quite a tough thing to do Uh, so this is more of the the kind of the thicket end of the thicket fenwolf mosaic, um, and uh, it's quite dense, but also also really rich. And if you look up on the up on the ridge there, that is a dense uh, invasion of of uh, acacia cyclops. We're going to get in, have a look under there, see what kind of ecological damage they're doing. Uh, but right here. Um, this is all pretty good um, uh, this is a pretty rich system and uh, so you've got to kind of imagine a, a 10, 10 meter quadrat 10 by 10 where the species are then listed and the the covers estimated it's quite a it's quite a tough thing to do you kind of kind of like really stand on your tippy toes and try and estimate how dominant uh, different species uh, might be uh, I mean so this this Circea cronata here uh, you can kind of see it grows all along there and grows even growing even further on there so we would put in these like tall poles run uh, uh, run the 10 by 10s and then kind of go around go through the through the plot to kind of estimate what's going on uh, here's another species um, Sinancum elliptifolium ellipti uh, Sinancum ellipticum elliptifolium oh, I can never remember uh, get the right name for you there uh, one of the ways of knowing it's a synanchum you break it oh, let me get the come on come on focus there look at that look at that milky latex uh, classic synanchum uh, synanchums also always have uh, opposite leaves and come on focus there we go uh, they've got opposite leaves and, and they're creepers 
uh, make beautiful seeds that kind of float around. Okay, well that's this this kind of patch. I um, hope you got a bit of a feeling for what this what this vegetation now looks like uh, in terms of at least the thicket um, the thicket end of the dune fanbos thicket mosaic. I'll get I'll find another spot that kind of looks uh, more on the dunish end of of this vegetation. Here's a section that's a little bit more fanbosy than thickety. So we've got. Oh, we've got like Felicia echinata uh, in the daisy family. This is a reseeder. Uh, Passerina. Oh, I can never remember which Passerina species it is. I'll get the, the name there. Um, yeah, we've got some thicket elements here as well. Uh, this is Olea exasperata, but this is a dune endemic. Also an underground tree. You'll learn a lot about underground trees in my module. I'm infatuated with them. Scudia mertina. Um, looks like this nice, beautiful, kind of luscious uh, tree, but then it's hiding these like vicious thorns. Ow! Come on. Let me see if I can. Yeah, do you see that? Ah. Uh, yeah, so you kind of, kind of go up to it thinking, ah, oh, nice cuddly plant. It's hiding a whole bunch of thorns there for you. Ah, uh, oh, here's an indigophora. Ah, we've got an endogophora down here. Hey, come on, please focus. There we go. Let's get a, let's get a good get a money shot of the endogophora. Uh, oh, oh, I wish you were here to smell this. This is Agathosma piculata, the garlic buchu. You crush it. Oh man, always smells so. Gives this like gives the felt this like distinct. Uh, distinct smell. I can always tell when I'm uh, when I'm in the dune fanbos because uh, you kind of get a whiff of this when you're walking through it, and you know you can kind of you could put me blindfolded and I walk through. If I walk through this vegetation, I get that smell. I know exactly where I am. So distinctive. Uh, we got got Medalasia miricata here. Um, yeah, why am I like rattling off all these names? Um, to you just because I want I want to like just just get get into your heads that like just in these small little areas so much richness so much diversity just to like keep in mind what's gonna what we're gonna see when we actually get to some of the in, some of the invaded sites which look exactly like this yeah here's another here's a Salago um, yeah. yeah beautiful ah, look at that Beauty. More that Felicia. Yeah. Oh, we've got a helichrysum over there. Um, I think that's some Mosum. Oh, geez, I'm getting hay fever out here because there's so many things that are flying. It smells amazing. I uh, wish I could, like, bottle it and send it to you to kind of get an idea of what. Uh, what it's like to be out in this in this in this landscape right now. Okay, so anyway, this is a little bit more more of a, a fan bossy bit. We got a lot of reseeders here. That Agathosma is a reseeder. The uh, Felicia is a reseeder. This Passerina is a reseeder. And you're going to learn about reseeders and resprouters in in my module. Uh, so just kind of keep those terms in the back of your mind. Like what the what, what's he talking about? Reseeders, resprouters. Uh, you're going to learn. So this landscape burnt about, uh, I don't know, about 2017, um, yeah, so about four or five years ago, um, and you'd be like, oh no, fire, terrible for, for vegetation. These dune plants are completely fire adapted. Fire is a really important part of them, part of the component. In fact, this patch uh, looks like it burnt a little bit more recently than that. The, Things like this uh, Euclea racemosa should be a little bit taller, so maybe it's uh, about two or three years ago. But you see these kind of dead skeletons in the in the landscape here. So those are skeletons of the uh, Acacia cyclops, uh, and uh, could also be Acacia saligna. I think what's happened is that the fire, so the fire went through, killed them, and then any seedlings that have come up. The municipality has come through and, and they, they've pulled out those seedlings. But the crucial thing to, to realize is, is look how much taller the, those, those plants are, or they were, 
uh, before the fire came through in comparison to to this to the rest of the vegetation here this is part of the the kind of danger that these uh, uh, th these alien invasive plants uh, uh, cause is that they start growing much taller than the than the neighboring plants and then they start out competing for uh, out competing them for light so um, there was quite a uh, kind of a heavy in invasion here unfortunately they have come through and done some cleanup I, I, I have seen some evidence of cleanup but right here here's the acacia cyclops is going in it is all acacia cyclops I can't see any saligna uh, if you see this over here we go up to one of them um, so they reseed quite strongly after the, after the fire. Produce a lot of seed. Here they are. This is him here, and you can see this patch has now got a lot of got a lot of acacia cyclops. So a lot of reinvasion coming in here. Um, they need to need to come in and clear this. Oh, here's this cassonia again. This is a nice one. Cassonia thesiflora. Always loved always loved the leaves in these things. Hey, such a weird leaf. Looks like, looks like dinosaurs should have been feeding on this, but uh, yeah, Cassonia, Cassonia thesiflora. It's a nice, uh, also in, endemic to endemic to dunes, to the dune systems. Uh, man, I love this vegetation. Oh, we got ourselves some rescuers here. Some restios, restio iliocaris. Uh, oh, here's some Ficinia. Look at that. A, this is a weird looking Ficinia. They usually never look like this. Uh, oh, here we go. This is uh, uh, Phylica ericoides. Phylica is another genus that's dominant in the in the Fenbos. So, uh, and here's that Passerina again. Uh, I think it's Passerina corymbosa. There we go. Ah, the name would eventually come to me. It's a whole trick with botany. Forget a lot, uh, but you got, you learn a lot to forget a lot, and then um, eventually the names do come back to you. And ah, uh, oh, here's a Maroltia. I think they've just changed the genus name of Maroltias. Uh, this is the spiny Maroltia. Anyway, I'll post whatever its new name is. Yeah, yeah just so beautiful, man. This dune diversity, it's quite something. It's quite something. Um, so an interesting thing, like while we're just looking at this and while you're looking at your data, uh, that kind of 10 by 10 data and you're looking at the species list there, uh, an interesting thing <coughs> to know is that our dune systems are amongst the richest in the world. So you go put a 10 by 10 quadrat out in like California, Australia, uh, you know, anywhere that's got kind of like these coastal dune systems and we've got uh, lots lots more so like orders of magnitude more more species uh, there's one spot in the Mediterranean that we found that has got like a similar level of species diversity uh, we're not quite sure why we're still trying to figure out whether it actually is a dune system it's not very well reported oh I see a I see a painted lady butterfly over there I'm gonna try to sneak up to him oh, let's see oh beautiful Enjoying the Felicias. Let's see if I can get yeah, pollination in action. Ah, beautiful. Ah, oh, the painted lady. There we are. And uh, yeah, so we've got. Uh, you know, when we put a 10 by 10 quadrat here, we can easily get like between 60, 80 species, quite quite easily, um, in in kind of like uh, like that's that, that's kind of maxing out. And um, whereas normally in other Mediterranean or other dune systems across the world, you're going to get uh, maybe 10 species, maybe 15, maybe 20, max. But uh, so for some reason, well, we kind of think. We know what the reason is. Uh, we've got an incredibly high um, dune flora, like really, really biodiverse. Ah, check that out for a money shot. Beautiful. Ah, you can see the old uh, stems of the uh, an acacia that died. Thankfully, it doesn't look like there are any coming up here. 
That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, so why are these systems so much richer? Oh, there's another species, Rapania giliana. So there's one kind of ramet there, above ground ramet. There's another one over there. There must be another one. Ah, there it is over here. Yeah. Ah, so the we ah, there's another one over here. Okay. And there should be, we should be able to track them for like a good 10, 20 meters. So Rapania giliana kind of can grow up to about a meter in height. And then, um, uh, but doesn't, you know, it stays fairly stunted. Its sister species is Rapania melanophlorus, which if that name means anything to you, uh, you'd associate with forests. It's like a 10 meter tall tree. Uh, and here, the sister species has shifted into dunes and it's now, it's now growing like, super low and actually there are there are branches underground branches that connect all of these so this instead of growing super tall like the trunk actually kind of uh, has sunken down grows under the ground and pops up and so you can get like you can get them growing and branching for like many tens of meters we we don't quite know how far they get to uh oh look at that see there there's a bee ah Serious pollination going on today. Um, oh yeah, why, why is this so? Why is this so rich? Uh, uh, why is this dune landscape so rich? Is well, actually, for the most of the last the two million years, we had a landmass the size of Ireland, um, kind of the size of Free State, that was off uh, off the, our coast um, when 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 uh, South America pulled away from the African continent, it kind of tore some of the continental plates and made this really low kind of, or shallow Agullis bank. Uh, I'm sure you kind of remember the Agullis bank from geography days. But, you know, when, when glaciers suck up all the water in the, you know, into the polar ice caps, sea levels drop, and then we've got all this new land surface area you know, massive land surface area that goes out. Um, you know, I, I think I think they say something like from Cape Town, you would have had to walk 200 kilometers during a during an ice age, 200 kilometers directly south, to be able to uh, get to the beach. Uh, Cape Townians would have loved that. Hmm. Um, and so uh, we would have only had to walk about three or four kilometers, just because the the way the configuration of the uh, uh, of the of the of the coastline. Oh man, just look at the diversity here. It's so beautiful. Man, this is gorgeous money shots. Anyway, we had this massive land area. So the last like two million years during all these glacials. Remember, the last two million years, more than like 90% of the time was spent in a glacial phase. These kind of warm interglacials that we're at in the moment are, are a bit bit weird. Um, oh, here's another here's another dune, dune endemic. Um, this is, remember the Fabaceae, it's an Aspelithus, uh, Aspelithus subtingens, subtingens, yeah, anyway, back to uh, why the, why we got all this, um, uh, why we got all the species diversity here, is because we have this massive land area, and of course it's going to be covered mostly by marine sands, so we would have had all these dune systems, that would have just been uh, all over the place, given this massive open area. Oh, check out, ah, look at this. Here's the rest of you again, oh, beautiful, popping up in there. So we would have had this massive, um, massive uh, area of dunes for all of the, the kind of more terrestrial species, like more inland species, to kind of come and, and uh, uh, kind of, invade and speciate on and so what's then happened is that subsequently we had this large area for speciation to house this um, large number and diversity of plants and then as the sea levels have uh, have kind of increased and the land area and the dune areas receded we've had all that species diversity kind of like pushed up kind of pushed up uh, against our coastline into, into these kind of dune areas at the moment so this is this is really incredibly rich, uh, rich landscapes. And 
uh, in, in, terms of bio, in terms of biodiversity. Quite amazing, actually. Oh, I've got to show you this as well. Morella quercifolia. Quercy, quercus, being the, being the oak. So it's got an oak-like leaf. Now, morellas don't normally have this. Um, and so this is Morella quercifolia. You can see it always grows in a bunch like this. Um, quite dominant on dunes, but also you find it on the more kind of inland fanbos types. I just love it. Just such a such a beautiful looking looking leaf. And you wonder well, like why the oaks came up with this kind of leaf structure, and then something in a completely different family, completely different genus, and it comes up with something that looks like that, and then none of the others do it. Like evolution. So weird. There's some. Uh, that looks like Acacia saligna over there that's growing. You can kind of see what the natural dune vegetation in this kind of like Fainbos area. Uh, this is kind of more the Fainbossy end of the Fainbos thicket mosaic uh, that kind of comprises these dune systems. Uh, but they're uh, growing taller than everything else, uh, Acacia saligna. Um, and then if we, like, but what a money shot. I mean, geez, look at the. That's pretty beautiful, if, if you didn't know that that's a kind of sign of impending doom. Um, but then, if we kind of turn around, kind of stare into the sun, you can see here's all uh, natural vegetation, and there's the invasion front. That's the kind of mature uh, acacia cyclops it's got going. We're going to go and have a look under there, kind of see what kind of a plague that's caused in, the, in these landscapes. Uh, really get an idea of what these... Uh, uh, early kind of European botanists who kind of shipped seed all around thinking that they were solving the world's problems. Uh, what, what they did when they came and released this, like what, what, what were the ramifications? Um, I always like the, what, what Frank Herbert in, in one of the, the Dune books says, I think it was the first book, you know, so he says, uh, ecology is the science of understanding consequences. So here, these were botanists who kind of thought that they were doing something doing something good, coming in, stabilizing the dunes, bringing in something from Australia, sending the seeds in the, kind of in their envelopes and old postal system, and then just releasing them here. And yeah, it just caused a flippin' plague. Oh yeah, made it in. Um, I mean, just look at this. Flippin' crazy. You know, if you just think about that diversity that I was showing you a moment ago, and here I am, like struggling to crawl through. Um, oh, there's a, a bit of a cyanancum kind of growing there. Uh, here's a chrysanthemoides that's kind of set seed there. Um, there's something else. Uh, this will come to me. Uh, this is a solanum. That's it. It's a solanum africanum, I think. But just just look at this. Like in comparison to what we were what I was showing you. I'm actually on my knees here. I can't, I can't even stand here. It's just, it's just sucking up so much light. I'm cold. I was out there in the sun, kind of sweating. I've got sweat dripping down my back. Now I'm underneath this canopy. There's no light being, like all the plants underneath here are being starved for light. So the only one's kind of hanging in there. There's a creeper. Uh, I think that's a cyanancum, a different cyanancum there. But otherwise, all the other things. Um, you know, this should be rich in both thicket, all fain boss elements. Like, there's there's nothing here. There's there's actually like that's a understory forest grass over there. Um, don't know where that came from, but um, you know just looking and and also the kind of nature of this. You know, there's just check this 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 is all acacia saligna leaves. So underneath all of this, you know, these leaves are. Uh, you know that's that's a lot of that's a lot of mulch. There might be some allelopathy going on here. Uh, but this is, you know, the, the fainbor seeds don't know how to like punch up through this and when they do, they get into this and they've got, you know, fainbor, so those fine leaves, that means they're adapted to really high light conditions. So they eventually use all the energy to punch up through this leaf litter and then boom, into this like light deprived uh, area and then, and then they just die. So, you know, the, the diversity under this kind of stuff, just tanks, and we lose so much of our, our natural landscape. I'm on the exact same geology. I'm like, I'm, I'm 15 meters away from 
uh, like uh, a 10 by 10 where I can probably get up to 30, 40 species really easily. And a 10 by 10 here, I'm going to be lucky if I lucky if I get to like 10, 15 species. But again, the evenness is going to be completely um, disproportionately biased towards this bloody uh, uh, acacia cyclops. I mean, you, you look at this. It's even it's 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 even creating so much uh, light stress for its own lower branches that the lower branches don't even have leaves. Only the upper upper branches, uh, you know, you can see all the way through there. Only the upper branches have have still got leaves. Absolutely. I mean, this this is this has changed the rules of the game in, in, entirely. Uh, you don't get this much mulch at all in normal June June fame. So there's even like an accumulation now of of, of mulch. And then the other thing you also got to think about. I told you these were fire-driven systems. Just look at all this dead wood that's just standing here. This fine stuff, and it's just the, the fires that are going to come out of this stand are going to be way, way greater than the fires that we're going to get outside the stand in, 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 in the fanball. So, if you've got this near any human infrastructure, you know, there's a good chance that um, your fire is going to get out of control and it's going to be incredibly hot and could really uh, you know, harm infrastructure, even like potentially take some lives. Whereas you've got far more control if it's going through something like Fainboss because it's just less fuel. But I mean, just look at this. This is just crazy. I, I, can't, I can't even move. I, can't, I was thinking of like, maybe I'd be wandering around here, but I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just crazy. I, I, I'd have to leopard crawl through this completely. And if you can just consider, I was just wandering through a, a moment ago there. I just come out of that, that stand there. I feel like I can finally breathe. And you can just see the, you know, the light, there's just so much more light and so much more diversity. And just going back to that, like all these things are so fine leaved that, you know, they're fine leaved because they're used to dealing with incredibly high levels of light. And uh, the moment they get shaded out, I mean, just look at all these fine, fine leaves. And, um, and so they just are not shade tolerant at all. So here's a stand that, that burnt fairly recently. So this is like maybe three, four years old. And um, anyway, this, is, this might also just show you the, the effect of, of what these plants have. Um, this will be a bit easier for me to kind of like move around and show you what's going on. You can see all, the, all that mulch uh, that I showed you in the, just now has all been burnt off, got converted into this stuff. And, uh, but just, just look at this. Let's get in under there. Geez, I, I still can't move all that, all, all that much under here. All my hands and knees kind of crawling around. You know, there are a couple of things kind of hanging in there. But really, like this diversity is just completely stuffed. You know, we don't find any of the phylicas. Hardly finding anything. Oh, even look at this poor copper brotus. Oh, I'm not looking happy at all. Even the plants just look unhappy. Now, I mean, the other interesting things is that even the species that survive under here, generally you find that their flowering is way, way lower just because they're not getting enough light. So they don't have enough energy. And yeah, so this is what it looks like underneath, uh, you know, four to five year old uh, in, uh, kind of stand of uh, acacia cyclops. Of course, you know, the seed bank's already been affected here. Uh, who knows how long this stand's been here. Every time a fire comes through, it kind of gets burnt down. Uh, but then they just grow up again, and they just carry on stealing all the light. And you can see this is starting to develop, starting to develop that, that mulch layer. Who knows how old that stand was that I was in earlier? Probably more than like 15, 20 years. Yeah, look at this. And you can see that's even with, so these, this is uh, not a natural thing. This is Biocontrol, I've got another video on this, I'll share that with you. Uh, you can find out more about that. So even with biocontrol in this landscape, this, uh, this uh, community has just kind of rebounded after the fire. Oh man, you just got to get in here and clear it away manually. Yeah, I can just see how thick it is. Yeah, and, and uh, we can compare this. Let's come out here a little bit. And we can compare this with, uh, so here's, here's a indigenous tree species, Euclea racemosa, uh, and here's Loridia 
tetragona that's uh, that's uh, fruiting there it's not that fruit but you can just see like the difference in in height you know they all would have burnt the same time and these guys are just shooting up and these guys are struggling to to keep up um, and which were which which is why they get shaded out here's acacia saligna you can see this rust this is another form of biocontrol that's been released it's a rust form but uh so this is another one of the real terrible species also from australia different sides of the australian uh coastal coastal margin i forget which but you know cyclops is from one end from the west say for example and then uh, saligna is from the east and they both come to south africa to meet up and cause complete and utter havoc uh, but you can see this rust is doing some effect uh, at least it's, it's going to slow down seed production a little bit but is it doing it enough you know when these trees start dying then i'll then i'll be then i'll be happier Alrighty, that's all i got for you to, for today i hope that kind of helps uh, helps you understand what's going on in that data set a little bit more kind of put some uh, put some faces put some plant faces to some of those names in that in that list give you an idea of of what that data set is showing in the field um, for you just to like really appreciate uh, what it is we're losing and why we've got to get in and sort out these uh, alien invasive plants as soon as possible all right cheers bye